live for 2023 the year the bomb went off hello everyone uh welcome to our little show of uh the forlorn dopes or tales from the forlorn dopes i'm your host cyber smiley i'm your co-host uh wisdom and i want to you know greetings programs welcome to the first episode of the new year uh, yes We've got exciting things coming up, and, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to get some more interviews. Yep. Um, it's, it's, we're all just praying, I think, that this year is better than the last. <laughs> I know I said. Well, I think it, uh, it, it can't be worse than, you know, 2020. <laughs> we never, ever say it can't be worse. That's just inviting disaster, my friend. Yeah. Uh, we just say we hope it's fucking bad because 2022 was just about as bad as it gets for me. Uh, yeah, true. But uh, yeah, we uh, we hope it gets better this year. Um, yeah. So um, on our little hiatus, were you able to check out any cyberpunk media at all? Uh, I was, um, however, I'm now having a brain fart about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I can, <laughs> I can tell you a little bit about, um, and again, you know, um, our little, uh, hiatus, I'm afraid real life kind of took a, a boot to my nuts as it were, um, when it came to free time, cause let's just say work work wasn't pleasant especially when i was supposed to be on vacation um so yeah the the things i saw um that were kind of cyberpunk related is uh, netflix they had um this show a series called 1899 um in the trailers it portrays the year 1899 a, a steam tramp um trying to go to America um, and and various weird things start happening uh, and at the end and I don't think it's gonna get picked up for another season but um, basically at the end you, you you found out that you know that the people are in a virtual reality simulator ah, and I would, I would not have expected that exactly so um, It'll be interesting. It would be interesting if there was a second season to explain what the whole story is. Um, I believe the producers are from uh, a show called Dark or The Dark, uh, which is another Netflix series. I think there's four seasons of that. Um, that is kind of more time travel. It's a great series. I, I recommend, highly recommend it, um, just because they were able to keep the whole time streams very in sync and it's when you start watching the series you have to like go back and watch previous episodes because you're like oh yeah that what, what? Um, because it's very self-referential I guess mm -hmm. um, so that was that was a good series uh, the other thing that I think was close to cyberpunk um, was uh, the midnight sky with George Clooney um, so I wanted to check that out. That yeah. looks pretty good. You want me to give you the plot? <laughs> sure. Or should I hold off? All right. So basically, no, we got a whole yeah. of people here listening. So yeah. So the so the plot is basically um, Earth is pretty much dead. Um, some tragedy, and I really couldn't determine exactly what happened, but 
some experiment that they tried basically caused the uh, atmosphere to become toxic to all life. Mm -hmm. So George Clooney is in a polar uh, research station, of course, you know, with, with the air becoming so polluted that it doesn't sustain life. The last area that would technically be affected is the uh, polar caps. Um, so he's in a research station up there. Um, there's some twists and, and turns there, but the, uh, the second story that's happening as he's trying to, you know, survive up there is a um, mission to Jupiter is making its return back to Earth and lost all communication, so they have no idea what's happening on Earth. Um, mm. So it was like a two-year mission out. Good. Yeah, it's a two-year mission out to, to Jupiter that's coming back. So it's, what was it, 2049, 48, I think was the year in the story. So it's a little bit kind of cyberpunky uh, in that it's near future, high technology um, kind of story, which, which I usually contribute to, to cyberpunk genre stuff. Um, but it, it was, uh, I had some problems with some of the plot. There was some interesting twists in it, um, that were nice, but there was also other, other things in it that, you know, kind of, I was annoyed because, um, basically at the end, everyone dies. <laughs> what I mean, everyone, I mean, no, all of no. humanity. There we go. So, uh, I watched uh, the Last of Us premiere on Sunday night. That was that was pretty good. You know, they pretty much followed the game beat for beat. So if they continue along those lines, it should be a pretty solid series. The acting was all solid. Yeah, uh, it has high ratings too. It's like ninety percent on um, plus ninety percent on uh, Rotten Tomato. I can't remember her name, but the little girl who played uh, Ellie. Who was also from uh, Game of Thrones? She played Lady Mormont. Yes, uh, she's a fantastic actress. I'm sure she'll do great with the role. However, the little the the girl that they had playing Sarah Miller, uh, I would have I would have switched those two roles. Like, yeah, um, she was fantastic. Were you able to but watch? That was, what was it? Uh, what else was recommended? Uh, Future Warrior? Um, Future Warrior. Uh, no, I don't think I've seen that one yet. Who was it? John um, gave us a recommendation? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I think next time we'll... It's on my list. Yes. It's just... Uh, Let's make it a point of uh, us reviewing it next uh, episode, as just, it were. Sure. That that'll work. Um, I also finished up the uh, the third season of Jack Ryan on Amazon. That was that was pretty good. It's not really cyberpunk, but it's kind of cyberpunk adjacent. Like, like high level could, espionage. It's, you could see a Black Ops team being inserted, and <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's like that. You could put that plot into a cyberpunk game, and it would it would flow seamlessly. Yeah, there was a movie um, back in the eighties that. Ne wasn't necessarily cyberpunk, um, but it was like two corporations going at each other trying to buy a, a an NFL team. And I could see like, oh yeah, they they were two media corporations, so they're constantly smearing each other. But I could see like taking that as a campaign and inserting Black Ops team and and other things uh, to to make it into a cyberpunk uh, absolutely campaign. Um, I mean, it's not really Jack Ryan from the books, so if that's what you're expecting with the series, you're you're going to be a little bit disappointed. But as as its own thing, it's probably the best you know espionage show I've seen in a long time. It is it is very much not just guns a blazing all the time. Although there are, there is plenty of yeah, that reminds me, um, and I don't know if we talked about it on the podcast, but Thomas Clancy had what was it net. It wasn't Netwatch. It was something net. 
um, that they actually made into like a, a mini series. Netforce. Hmm. That's it. Um, uh. So so Netforce was kind of cyberpunky, and that it was kind of like bleeding edge um, technology. Uh, a little yeah. far, not necessarily far future, but near future. Definitely sci-fi. Um, well, I mean, several of the uh, several of the Tom Clancy ba- uh, labeled games have have certainly skirted the edge. Like the uh, some of the re- Ghost Recon games from like the mid two thousands uh, were like Future Force, and they all they all took place in. Uh, a near future setting which you know to me that makes him cyberpunk yeah yeah so, uh, so um, but he's got there's there's just so much that falls under the whole uh clancy brand that it it really gets overwhelming at times trying to figure out you know what it all means in relationship to each other yep i didn't read the books so uh, well i read I read the original Jack Ryan books, so I had those, but I didn't read most of the stuff. So just right, slipped under my radar. Um, the other upcoming series, movies, something that's coming out that's kind of cyberpunky. Um, the only thing I'm seeing on the radar is like uh, the Pod Generation. Which looks like it's a near future. I think I talked about it in previous episode. Megan. Um, now that yeah, it's that, kind of out, is good. is very. Uh, was it kids play? Is it child's play? Child's play. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's child's play with an android. Yeah. So that's out. Um, also. Uh, there is a 2077 novel that is supposed to be coming out in August this year. Yeah, we talked about that uh, on the last podcast yeah. before the hiatus. And it's, so. uh, it, 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 I, I can't see it being as bad as the as the 2020 novels. Um, so we're just going to keep our fingers crossed. So far, all the all the 2077 stuff has been top notch. So. Well, just to remember, oh, of course, um, Sikowski uh, did. Sk- bleh, bleh, Seth. <laughs> he, <laughs> We're he, never going to let him live that down. Yeah, he, he did put it as a t- two or a three on Goodreads. So he it, thought it he, he found some he goodness is, in it. He is a. He has a far more generous soul than I am. <laughs> but yeah, f- for um, for the 2077, Amazon actually has a blurb about it. So you can actually read uh, what it's supposed to be about. It looks like there's... Uh, was it? This newly formed gang composed of veterans turned renegade, a sleeper agent from Militech, a computer nerd, a therapist, a ripper doc, and a techie. Must learn how to overcome their differences and work together, lest their secrets be unveiled before they can pull off the next deadly heist. Yeah, that's sounds like a little bit of something for everybody there. At least everybody's a fan of, of the game. Very true. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. So, so the problem when you're doing sci-fi and and trying to find it up or find anything that's upcoming there's so many superhero stuff yeah or fantasy and i'm like that's not sci-fi you just kind of throw it all together like that and uh hope for the best but when you're trying to find something it's it's very not conducive to that yeah so um other news so black chrome is coming out this yeah, year yeah it's <laughs> they they put out the official advertisement blurb from our Talsorian, the announcement and uh it's at the printers yeah it's at the printers it's 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 finally happening it's real it's coming and we'll get our hands on it i have to say that i think other 
it beats uh, version 3 from uh, when it was announced to actually being produced. So It does. Cause uh, I, I, really... I mean, it's, it's what everybody's been waiting for, so... Yes. Uh, a little bit of gear porn is, is nothing but good for, for the game. I like to read what the Economy 101 section is. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting tidbits in there. They haven't they haven't released too much information, but what does what they have has certainly piqued my interest. Yeah, so that's coming out on hopefully next month, maybe March. We'll see. Um, yeah, so now they have what the uh danger girl dossier is still uh has to come out and rogues uh, what was it rogue something or other and then of course uh the edge runner supplement as well as uh 2027 or 2077 yeah so it's uh like things are in the pipeline things yep. are uh things are progressing and it's looking good so the other thing um which i think we wanted to address because it's the 400 pound gorilla in the room um happening within the gaming community is uh the ogl yeah. and what's going on with wizards um and whether or not it's a good thing bad thing should you know our Tessarian adopt it um I, again, I think both of us have kind of, <clears throat> I wouldn't say used and abused uh, our Talsorian's properties, but or IP, but we, we've kind of borrowed heavily from it and, and tried to produce it. And I think from, from our point well, of view... I mean, view, we've created fan, fan, you know, works for the game, which mm. we're not, we've never tried to make any money off of it, so I'm not... And I think that's that that's a, a different thing compared to today, right? Um, yeah. Back in the today, 90s, everybody wants to try and make money from everything. So. Which, which you know, hey, I'm putting in the time. You know, I deserve compensation. And yes, I I, I agree with some of that. Um, I think the 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 '90s generation was, hey, I'm a fan. I'm just going to produce stuff. And give it to the community. Um, whether it's yeah. right or not, I'm not going to judge <laughs> on which which methodology is is true. Um, well, I mean, the OGL for third edition just on the one hand, it let everybody who was you know writing for that game uh, self publish and get you know get their ideas out there. Some of them. Some of them worked, some of them didn't, but it created such a massive glut of, of product for Dungeons & Dragons that it was, I mean, for 10 years, that's all anybody played. That's all you could get anybody to play. Um, right. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing overall, it was certainly a good thing for the industry overall. Uh, and as far as whether it was a good thing for Wizards of the Coast at the time... That's probably up for debate. Like, on the one hand, every new product was free advertising for them because you still had to have the player's handbook. You still had to have the GM guide. Um, but at the same time, it, it created such a market of competing properties that, yeah, it's it's very much up for debate as to whether it was a boon to Wizards of the Coast or a, or a hindrance. Well, in my view, and again... You know, it's just my opinion, not necessarily fact, is I think it was um, a <laughs> kind of a, a bad decision for them, right? So, so there's <clears throat> there's ways in which to control it, right? So the the one way of controlling it is similar to what our Talsorian does with the homebrew rules, which is basically, hey, you can use our stuff, you can't take verbatim from our books, you can't replicate everything that would bar someone from buying our books um and there's certain things you can't include right like um um stats for for 
for various NPCs. So there's that methodology. However, as a as a creator, you're then kind of forced to, hey, I have to give this up for free. And granted, there's there's some leniency on on that, right? So you can still produce stuff um, for free, and you can still have some type of little bit of revenue, right? Which is through Patreon, but you know the 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 materials you present have to be free. Patreon is just people giving you tips um, towards towards your work, and that's one sure. mentality, you know. And then you have like Chaosium, who also has an OpenGL. However, a lot of their OpenGL, if you actually read it, is there's a lot of things that are like. For example, Call of Cthulhu, one of their biggest properties. There's some core <laughs> mechanics that you cannot include with their OpenGL, right? So, like certain things, like in Call of Cthulhu, there's the whole concept of insanity, um, which is very important to the whole game, and, and kind of the game kind of revolves around it. You can't include that in anything you produce. So you you gotta kind of have to put it off to the side. Um, and not mention it. So, so there, there's, and of course, then there's OpenGL, which <coughs> you have the game mechanics and also other attributes within there. And, and you know, there, there's, I've, I've watched quite a few um, YouTubers discussing the whole topic and the whole concept of supposedly, you know, you cannot copyright game mechanics. That is yeah. currently a belief that they can't because of a, a precedence that was made back when Monopoly or, or some board game was made, right? That you can't, some case, you know, said, hey, you can't include um, mechanics or mechanics aren't copyrightable. Um, however, you can, you know, you, you can't copy, hey, this is Monopoly, this is... Mr. Monopoly, etc., and, and this is Park Avenue and stuff like that, but you could copy other things. Now, no one's gone to court yet with that to, to, to determine whether or not that's truth or or, fat or, or, or fiction. Um, but yeah. the concept is... Um. And that's why you have so many... Um, um, even computer games, you see it, right? You have so many generic, uh, like just arcade games that are constantly being produced that people are paying for. Yeah. Um, I mean, one side scroller is the same as any other side right. scroller, which is not a whole lot of, you're not going to get a whole lot of variation in them besides, you know, what's ha might be happening in the background, but you're still just flying along shooting stuff. It's, so I, I think there's, there's ways in which creators can still turn a profit as long as they make it generic. Now, um, the the one thing that you know was brought up is okay and and i think it's something that even in the homebrew rules said hey you can say this is for cyberpunk but you can't say this is an official thing right you have to put in certain verbiage to make sure you distance yourself in your product from their their property which is by all means um you know, a way in which they can protect their IP. I, I highly doubt that RTG is going to go with an open source. Um, I know Chaosium has kind of signed on with uh, Paizo around an, uh, an open game system. What that game system is going to be is not necessarily what, um, what Chaosium's products are going to use, right? Which is their skill system. Or, or how that game system develops, but they're looking to make a, a game system that just has mechanics and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and going back to your point of whether or not it, it was a good thing or bad thing for, for Wizards of the Coast, I will have to argue that it was a bad thing because towards the end of third edition, Paizo with Pathfinder became the market share and they yeah, were the market I mean, share for the till fifth edition uh finally brought them back and that market share was based on D, &D was based on the not just the mechanics but 
you know, several, you know, copyrightable um, <laughs> IP. I mean, Pathfinder is and always has been just D&D with a different name. Right. Slightly slightly so. altered rules, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's for all intents and purposes, it's just Dungeons and Dragons. So Wizards of the Coast um, didn't see a dime of Pathfinder's success. Right. right. And now, since then, I guess Pathfinder has moved on to become its own thing, but it's still very much <clears> rooted <throat> in, like, the three... Right. In, you know, third edition. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy to see why uh, the OGL is needing a change and all that. Yep. Um, I do think people are jumping the gun with all these with all this protest and outrage. Uh, this wasn't something they put into official policy. It was just a and <laughs> it was office memo it was from the legal team. Yeah, and it was a, a hey, we want to get your feedback on this verbiage. And of course someone read it and was like, "Oh, this is going to be the new, <laughs> you know, the 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 Bible and, and this is law now and yeah. it's not. I mean, my honest take on the whole thing is that it centered around D&D Beyond and so many people were wanting to get all these off-company supplements added in like they did with Critical Role and they're like, well, if you want your stuff... My opinion on the subject is that if, if people wanted their stuff to be added to D&D Beyond, then you know, D and D, uh, Wizards of the Coast would get you know some some royalties off of. Yep. Uh, that there's a whole lot of work that goes into D and D Beyond, and yep. honestly, regardless of your opinion of fifth edition or not, D and D Beyond is the greatest tool for a role playing game I have ever seen in my life. It made me want to play Dungeons and Dragons again, which is something I swore I would never do after they released fourth edition. <clears throat> Except for uh, uh, Cyber Smiley. Dot net for cyberpunk being an awesome tool for uh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <game. laughs> cybersmiley.net is every bit the awesome tool that uh D D beyond is. It, it's it's very true don't 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 get my message twisted i was i was speaking merely from a dungeons and dragons standpoint all right i, I will uh, call off the arasaka s strike team on you. yeah okay please yes um <laughs> I do not want to wake up to Morgan Blackhand standing him up on bed saying, you better watch what you're saying on the net there, boy. <coughs> uh, not that I think that's what Morgan Blackhand sounds like, but I can't do a Mike Pondsmith voice, so. Yeah, in, in my opinion, I think they're, you know, and people can chalk it up to corporate greed, but, you know, th there's millions of dollars um, that other people are making off of the D&D &D brand. And, you know, they're, they're looking for a taste. And I don't blame them to have it some taste. I mean, granted, you know, it's got to be reasonable. I mean. Well, I just don't think they want to fund the uh, the uh, competition anymore. Like, that's. True. Yeah, is, that's is true, the, too. Is the, is, is the OTL license there that they would, in that memo, is that a shitty idea? Yes. But it's not like that was the finalized version of what that was going to be. Mm. Um, and I can't fault a company for not wanting to fund or pave the way for its own competition. Like that's yep. that's just part of the thing. Um, all these companies that were like uh, that want to put out material for uh, their own supplemental material, following the you know fifth edition rule set and all that. If if they're really, I don't know. I, I I'm always, if you want to make money on something, uh, it's best to do it your own way. That's like, don't try and join somebody else's stuff. Otherwise, you're just trying to get paid for fan fiction. Basically, what you and I do is fan fiction. We mm. we're not trying to make money off of it. Uh, or are we? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to getting money for it, but that's never been never been my goal. Uh, yes, neither my goal either. Uh, well, I mean, my goal has at, my goal for a long time was to work for Artel Sorian, which 
you know, in effect would hopefully bring money into my pocket for that. But yeah, some dreams, some dreams, yeah, I just you realize that they're not going to happen. So. Yeah. Well, with, with my site, it was more like um, a hobby, right? So some people yeah, invest too. money into doing whatever um, and getting very they're not they are getting a reward but they're not getting a, a financial reward for their abilities so the money i put into my site um to keep it going granted it was free in the beginning it's a little more expensive now but um a little bit yeah <laughs> it, it, to me it's definitely well worth it and um it's it's no longer the days of geo cities and yes the good old days of free stuff yeah so um yeah all right uh i guess we're kind of done on the subject do you want to move on well i mean just my last word on the ogl subject is like wait until they you actually see what they're doing before you get all up in arms like it's okay to you know talk about it but all this all this i'm never playing D &D again is it's a little premature at this point yeah if you want to know a bad ga game company, go to uh, Games Workshop. Um, <laughs> or, sorry, a money, <laughs> a, a greedy, money, uh, hungry uh, Yeah, I mean, gaming or Palladium company. Games. Like, it, it, when they're, when they, when, when Wizards of the Coast starts suing fan sites uh, and sending them cease and desist orders, that's, that's when you know things have tipped the scale. Yep. Uh, so all right oh, yeah. our, our little diatribe on various subjects in the real world and uh upcoming stuff i think we're kind of done so we're starting the year off on a on a second uh show within a month so therefore we're going to be doing a book review and the book review we're doing is bartmos's or sorry, Rach Bartmos's Guide to the Net. Um, yeah, the published. Definitive look at the internet of 2020. This was published back in '93. Um, <clears throat> there was uh, quite a few authors in here. Um, Edward Bloom, and again, if I'm butchering these names, it's because <laughs> the the scan I have is horrible. And also the the, yeah. the color combination they used was pretty not that great. I mean, it's definitely shocking and, and eye-catching, but for reading purposes, not so much. Um, you have David Ackerman, uh, who is also an editor. Um, Derek Quintanar, who is also an editor. And Steven uh, Subram, with contributors of Bert can't even read that name. Combs? Combs? Uh, yeah, you've got me. Uh, my, my version of this is... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Marcus Darby, Mike Malecki, and Mike McDonald. Um, I'm sure he changed his name to Mike McDonald and not Michael McDonald. Because he can't forget... Uh, that song? I don't <laughs> get that reference. Really? Michael McDonald? You don't know who that is? No. He was, some, he was part of the Doobie Brothers. Um, oh, had yeah, a that's... solo career. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I consider myself pretty hip on music. No, I, he Back in the 80s and 70s? On my radar. I would probably know the music, but... Yeah, uh, I, I'll play for you. You'll you'll be like, oh, that Michael McDonald. Yeah. Um. Yeah, the Doobie Brothers were never my kid. <laughs> and I'll just say that. So. Um, the art in the book uh, was quite a few, um, but mostly silicon graphics. Um, so silicon graphics, computer science. They actually created a bunch of um, computer graphics back in the day, and I think there was videos. So, so the imagery in here, um, there's actually like animations uh, associated with it, 
which is which I was kind of surprised that Altar Sorin was able to get. <laughs> um, yeah, this into their thing. Um, but yeah, they're they're, and again, I, I think was from the, a good. Yeah, from a modern standpoint, <clears throat> this art is very dated. Uh, at the time it came out, it was it was fantastic. It was cool. It was. Um, it, at the time, it was fairly state of the art, especially for you know a gaming supplement. Uh, but looking back, it's it's like watching reruns of Reboot or Lawnmower Man. It just it's a little the art is a little dated. It still it still works for what it's supposed to do, and with the uh, with how people look at cyberpunk these days as being like retro futurism it, it it works perfectly with that um but yeah it's it was when it when when this book first came out the art in it was a new concept in gaming really uh it was the first it wasn't the first time i'd seen computer art represented in a game book but it was the first time i'd seen it to this extent yeah, and I, I think you can probably uh, go to uh, YouTube and try to find um, some of the graphics uh, that they have and actually see the animations that were associated with um, with this book. I'm trying to think uh, specific examples, but I know um, throughout my years I've seen a lot of the images animated <clears throat> um, huh. I don't know that I have really yeah yeah so this was something new every day it, and I think into... well well the and again um, your ultra chrome book yeah, uh, with the the woman laying back, I think was a derivative or a animation was a derivative from something that um, the the silicon graphics did as an animation. The with the ultra chrome, the the art that I found, uh, it's it's derived from Hajime Soriyama's sexy robots, right? Which I think kind of is a blend of, of that whole thing um yeah so uh, the other thing that ultra chrome is is itself based off of uh it, it's it's just andrew james's uh, cyberpunk gear list just illustrated just with some images thrown along because made it more accessible for my games right um, the brilliance of that article is is all Andrew James and his reference book. Yes, which everyone is still using to this day. No, absolutely. I would say of all the net-based fan material, it's it's probably the most useful thing that was ever created for Cyberpunk. Um, just as, just as like wide use and still getting used to this day, like everybody uses it. It was the very first thing I ever saw online. Uh, it's good going, pal. You did you did great. And, uh... <laughs> yeah. So the other interesting thing about this book and, and there's quite a few interesting things about this book that I, I don't think was ever replicated um, in any of the other source books is uh, I think I'm pretty sure this is the only book that had colored pages within it um, for Cyberpunk 2020 I don't think there was any others that actually had full color and granted there the original Chromebook yep yeah, you are right. It had full color art in it. Uh, but in between the two, yeah, I can't. I can't think of anything else. 
the other thing about this book um, was, and we when we start getting into it is there are various terms and phrases that are highlighted uh, within the book and that have a side panel that gives a description of what that term or phrase means, at least in the, from a gaming sense. Um, so, yeah, when we're getting into it, you know, on page four where the book actually starts, and again, this is a pretty big supplement. It's 152 pages, which I don't think is the biggest, but it's definitely not the smallest <laughs> and above average uh, when it comes to content. Uh, I mean, for a book that's almost nothing but lore, uh, background information for your games, it's it's that's a pretty hefty page count. And it's definitely well worth the read. It um, is. So this book kind of introduces you to the famous or infamous uh, Raish Bartmos. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. That's the way I've always pronounced it. Who is the ultimate hacker. And you actually have a, a profile image of him on the first page. And his... Yeah. Accomplice friend Spider Murphy and um, Spider, of course, makes a, a kind of a, a quick. Um, well, both of them make a, a appearance within 2077. There is still quite a large debate on whether you actually find Bartmos's body. Um, that is that is a, a hefty topic of discussion on the on on Reddit and Facebook. And I don't believe or not that's actually Bartmos. And I think at one point, uh, Mike Pondsmith came in and like threw more oil on that fire, mm -hmm. uh, which was quite brilliant. Uh, I love the way he stirs up shit. Well, I see a lot of the posts I see from Mike seems like a cat playing with a mouse. Uh. <laughs> he is so tongue in cheek about everything. He's, yeah. So, um, so we really don't know all the facts, and I think the the other problem, and something I brought up with when people were debating, and I forget, I think it might have been about um, Morgan Blackhand, but it's like, okay, I can give you the facts according to this source, but again, Mike was slick enough to put in, oh, the data crash changed everything. So whatever you're reading was changed by the well i don't think it was the data crash i think it was the paper virus right which that was <laughs> yeah that was strictly the paper virus was strictly you know v3 D D v3 yeah well, um, i'm so very glad that they ignored that because that just doesn't even make sense but there was still the data crash itself that very much did happen in the red timeline uh which just made a mess of all, you know, digital stored media. Yep. And whether you consider um, the, the canon that's written in these books, stored media, um, and affected by the data crash, you know, it, it kind of gives um, Altar Sorian to, to kind of play around and do a little bit of retconning uh, when they need to. Yeah. It, it definitely... It definitely gives Mike the uh, the opportunity to really stir that pot up good. Just every now and then he'll drop a comment just to just to see the the fan base like lose their minds. Yeah, that's it's brilliant. I love that Mike still does things like that. So the first chapter is introduction. Um, basically, the the whole book is based off of the perception from uh, Bartmoses, with various uh, input from Spider, and then of course you have the the side bars that contain a little more information specifically around um, the game history and lore so it's not necessarily the perception i assume it's not necessarily the perception of uh bartmos who of course has a very skewered 
view, which Spider Murphy does talk about why you shouldn't believe everything Bart Moses says because you know, um, dude's nuts. Yeah, it well, he's supposedly he knocks some of his brains out literally, um, in the text, and and that's something you you definitely want to read about. Um, I think that's in the the. And again, it's been a while since I've read this, and I should have spent a little time uh, skimming through this um, before the show. But um, basically, he, Bart Moss has knocked his head, and I forget if, which chapter it is. Um, and to the point where brain started coming out of his interface plug, uh, and he just stuck it back in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Yeah, that 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 definitely reads like some like a story that Rache Bolt would put out, and uh, the dude was known to stretch the truth. Yes, but the introduction kind of sets you up on the the journey you're about to take within the net, and the following chapters are basically uh, regional uh, lore that uh, starts getting into, and ag again the the. They introduce well, not again, but they introduce a, a new concept at least within net running, is the regional maps. Which uh, from the basic book you had, you had a city map, you had a data fort map, and you also had the world map. Um, regional maps added a layer in between the world map and the city map. Uh, I think to add in more cities. To allow yeah. netrunners uh, a little bit more options when it comes to building up trace and and, and diving into various cities uh, that exist. And not only is this book great for the net, it also gets into describing other areas. Uh, yeah, I mean, so much so much information about the world of cyberpunk itself comes from this book. Uh, especially in areas that you know weren't covered by Eurosource or Pac Rim, um, the, if you're trying to flesh out the overall world as a GM or even just as a player, uh, just looking to know what's going on in the world, this this book is fairly invaluable. I think the biggest miss miss, um, and again, it's with with all our Tersorian products. It could be because they never found someone who could write on it. Is there's really very little description of India and South South Central Asia. Um, there's yeah. it's it even in even in Pac Rim, it's just kind of glossed over. Uh, it's barely mentioned, you know. Um, yeah, which is interesting because you know of of and again. I don't know if the 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 prophet Pondsmith uh, could have seen how big of uh, a tech giant India would become. Yeah, I mean, if you'd asked me what India was going to look like in the '90s, you know, 30 years from then, the idea that they would be, you know, leading the charge on, you know, every uh, IT job on the planet just would not have even been fathomable, fathomable to me. Um, that's that's the way that's the way you know the future works. Like it's the stuff that you don't expect that never gets. Yeah, um, and India has become an absolute powerhouse, uh, which is weird because you know so much of that country is still living in abject poverty. And there are just so many people there. Yep. Um, so the real first chapter, other than the introduction, we start off with uh, Pacifica in that region, <clears throat> in which it starts talking about uh, how that region is uh, compared to other regions within um, the net. So each region has a different look and feel to it. Um, mm -hmm. This one is mostly a water type with wandering dolphin programs. 
which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I mean, it's it very much uh, feeds into my own version of what the net looks like. Uh, for me, it's on a much more, you know, detailed, smaller scale. Uh, but yeah, the idea that, you know, this is what the net architecture, you know, you jack in, this is what you see um, as a three-dimensional virtual representation. It, it, it works very well. Yep. And like I said, the art seems a little dated now, but back then, sure, it, it, was, uh, it was the tits. As it were. And each chapter is broken up into various segments. So it, it talks about the region. It also then goes into the various cities within the region, which then provides you with city maps uh, that you can use within your game. Um, the various power factors that are within there. For example, in, in Pacifica, you have... Um, was it France, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Arasaka as a force, the Far Asian uh, co-prosperity sphere, or facts, as it were. Yeah. <clears throat> so it starts describing who these factions are, or how much power they have within this particular district, um, and then the final kind of section points into points of interest whether it's a bbs board or or some other uh item that you might want to pay attention to and this is where you'll get a lot of the uh data forts uh that you can actually use and reuse uh within your game the one thing that i liked about this particular supplement and and you can definitely see it on page 34 with the um Falaj, f uh, all right. I'm gonna get Philo this. Philogaya, Philogaya, <laughs> yeah, Philogaya data fort. Um, and and this was something that really opened my mind on net running is making it a multi-layer data fort. Uh, yeah, and stacking it as it were. And then understanding, looking at a data fort in three dimensions. Right. Okay. Can I yeah. get to this? How do I get to this particular square? Or can I get to this particular square? Um, and, and seeing the various routes uh, within the data fort, which I kind of like just opened my mind and, and really, wow, this is this shows a lot more depth that you can have within net running in 2020. Precisely. Uh, everybody, because of the way Data Fortresses had traditionally been laid out in Cyberpunk, everybody's kind of conceived it as a flat two-dimensional space. But, you know, that's not... That's, as video games showed us, that's not what the net would look like. It would be three-dimensional in, in your... in your jacked-in state. Uh, so... This, this helped flesh that out more. And it's, like I said, it opened up a lot of people's eyes to that possibility. Yep. And also, if you're looking for any particular uh, software, Pacifica has the shell traders who are going to be able to get you what you want when you want it. At a certain price, of course. Indeed. Uh, and then each chapter ends with a particular uh, net runner who, who is often in the region and, and Pacifica actually has kind of a, a semi-famous guy, uh, Magnificent Curtis, who I believe is uh, Raish's uh, kind of uh, protege. protege, nemesis, I don't know. Ex-protege, yes, I should say. Yeah. Um. But there is a rivalry between the two. Yeah, he's he's the one gunning for voracious spots. Well, he's on the other side of the law too, isn't he? He's net watch. Yeah, he's he's very much net watch. It's <sighs> he's he's the white hat gunning for the outlaw. Like that's 
That's what he is. He's got the big iron. Yep. Next chapter, like I said, it turns into Olympia. <clears throat> um, I gotta say, that's actually one of my favorite images in the book. Uh, I don't know why, but it appeals. The kind of tower on a lake, or the building on a lake. Yeah, the, the, the digital fortress. Yeah. Like, I would actually hang that on my wall if I could. Yeah. Or at least I would have back in the 90s. <clears throat> yeah, so... Again, Olympia is, uh, as they describe it, is a large neutral zone of sorts scrawled across the western portion of the United States. Olympia is run yeah, it, from the Republic of Them Texans. Now, based on based on you know the lore of the of the Cyberpunk twenty twenty, the idea that Texas would be tech savvy enough to control this much of the net it's it's kind of weird to me um because they're portrayed as being fairly luddite uh but it also you know it makes things interesting yeah but texas is also kind of a place where a lot of the um weapon technology is created isn't it other that's, than California, that's absolutely true. Because they uh, they like their guns in Texas. They regulate very very laxly, I should say, if at all. So there's. Um, so yeah, I mean it makes sense. It's just one of those things like mm. just like Texas, you know, controls state of education in the United States. Really, uh, it's just one of those things they. You wouldn't think that that's the way it works, but that is, in fact, the way it works. Oh, one of the, the well, the first power player within within this region, of course, Militech. So I think they want to kind of have a hold on that. Um, and I love how the the Nevada Net not watch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Who are basically um, I don't think they're necessarily affiliated with Netwatch <laughs> um, which is why uh, I mean the case can be made either way really uh, it's just how you know individual GMs will interpret that I think as written I think you're right that they're probably not affiliated with their, oh. to their own thing if Bartmos likes them, uh, they're they're probably not <laughs> Netwatch. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 probably uh, somewhat easily corruptible and open and free. Uh, yeah, Olympia is a Olympia is a strange conglomerate, and not watch is is a fun concept. Yep. And again, like I mentioned earlier, there, there's these little blurbs. <clears throat> um, and it's interesting to, to read some of them uh, again and how the game mechanics are introduced. Um, so there's not really a, a consolidation of these rules, which, of course, would have been nice at the end of the book. Um, but just these blurbs on the various sides, which, of course, makes you have to go out and buy the book and hunt and pick uh, some of these some of this stuff to figure out exactly what's going on um yeah and then of course to to accumulate them into one source at least back in the day was was always a challenge it didn't help that you know none of the with the exception of the chrome books none of the artel serene books had indexes that would have really helped out a lot in a lot of situations. I know when I was researching any of the source books that I was creating, especially for conflict source books, I would pour over books and have to tab everything. Well, for any gaming product, 
back in the day, it was, just, it was you were lucky to get an index. Um, yeah, it was a blessing. It was it was a rarity. I mean, the best you had was basically the uh, the beginning part with the uh, content right breakdown of the various chapters yep. and what that um, a chapter heading of what it could possibly mean. I mean, even today, like even with the ref guide telling you which book stuff is in, some of that stuff is really hunt and peck. Like, oh, it's not, it's not here. Where is it? <laughs> yeah, and and I know the ref guide sometimes has page numbers, sometimes doesn't. Yeah, and that's what I tried to do with my referential um, data was to put in the page number. Yeah, one of these days I should go back and go through Ultrachrome and add page numbers. That is your task before 2024. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you got a year. I got a year. Um, also in this section, in one of the side blurb, it actually talks about uh, doing a micro net run into a cyber limb. Um, which basically points to the section towards the back in the appendix. Um, but I notice quite a few people, at least for the red part, how do I, how do I hack cyber limbs or how do I hack uh, items? So, yeah, because it's so prevalent in the, in the, in the video game that that's what people are expecting. Yeah. So... Um, you can convert these rules if you want. Um, I think it's kind of deadly. <laughs> so the video game yeah. is its a fun mechanic, but it's not realistic in my opinion. That, hey, I can just... I just look at you and within a certain amount of time, this is going to affect you. You're, you're definitely well, going to commit the idea suicide. In, in red is that everybody's connected to the net all the time. Uh, the, the assumption that everyone has cyberware um, and yeah. specifically a neuro, neuro processor. A neural processor that is, in fact, you know, a Wi Fi cable, which is quite the net in 2077 is, is vastly different from the net of red or even 2020. Yeah. And, and, then, and they're all vastly different from the real life internet. And in today's age with security constantly, at least the cybersecurity, constantly being honed and, and locking down further and further of how you can actually access things, right, is, is really detrimental to that kind of really fantasy yeah. idea of, hey, all I got to do is run a program and I'll, and I'll hack it. Um, yeah, the the 2077 mechanic is is great fun for the game, but it, it I don't think it would work well in an actual RPG. Or you uh, have the ideas that came from um, the series uh, Silicon Valley with their Pied Piper uh, yeah. product in which, oh, we just determined that this thing can hack anything within seconds. <laughs> Yeah, it's some it's some it's some neat sci science fiction, but it's that's really what it is. Which in a game where uh, it, that can be used against you, the fun wears off would wear off pretty quickly. And I think that's one of the problems I think with when you look at twenty seventy seven is sure, great, I can look at an NPC and cause them to commit suicide or pull a grenade pin. Guess yeah. what? If you're a proper cyberpunk GM referee, you have the same options to apply to players. Exactly. And, and it generally much from much more powerful sources. Uh, it's one of those, it's, it's one of those, it's a video game mechanic that, that works in the context of the video game but really wouldn't work outside of it uh, and create any joy for any, anybody. Yep. It's, uh, it's like the 2077 interpretation of Sandavistan. Like, it doesn't make you super fast. It just 
gives you a little bit of a boost to your initiative. Like, mm. yep. And this chap <clears throat> chapter also provides you with uh, two more cities: uh, Denver, well, part of Denver and part of Las Vegas. Um, and quite a few uh, data fort maps as well, which also includes a satellite office of orbital air and a, and a net watch uh, fort that, of course, you can always uh, replicate. I love the section on Petrochem. I, I, I love any anything that, you know, gives you more information about the world. I love lore. Um, Anybody who's been to my site knows how much I love lore. So, as I as I said, this book for anybody looking to deeper dive into the world of 2020. This is this is required reading. Well, this kind of is in my top books. I love not necessarily specifically for game use because again <laughs> the, the problem with this book is it's kind of geared towards one character or if you have a party of net runners but uh, it's it's very much you know role specific and it's used to the players but, as anything beyond just lore but reading this book really turned me on to loving net runners uh, as a class and as as a game mechanic um, because of how well it, it, it portrayed and really went in depth on the net yeah like I mean looking for most players looking back today uh, it's the impact that this book had when it came out just isn't really palpable uh, I mean, before this book came out, the, the net in 2020 was just this weird, amorphous, abstract thing that, you know, one class had access to and nobody else knew really anything about it. And the GMs were all just making shit up as they go. This, uh, this really fleshes it out and makes the net <clears throat> its own world, as it were. Yep. Own experience. And this section also, or this chapter, introduced the Hunt Club, um, mm -hmm. which was basically a BBS for netrunners <laughs> and hackers. Um, and even though the fort is very easy to get into, well, I wouldn't say it's completely easy to get into because the the data fort or the data f wall strength in in the code gates are pretty strong um, there's nothing that really is going to kill you inside um, it's a place for non-corporate net runners and, and various hackers to basically hang out and talk and, and jam um, and I always considered it something similar to what was it in the standalone complex where uh, the major goes into a, a hacker room with all the hackers yeah. in virtual space hanging out and talking. Yeah, it's just like a big virtual auditorium where they just all gather. Like, I, I got the same feeling. And, I mean, keep in mind, this book was written in the infancy. When, when they were still calling it the World Wide Web, uh, infancy of the Internet as we know it today, I mean... Everybody had personal Yahoo pages, but actual important information was, I don't know. It was still a very, very new concept for a lot of people. And that's why there's so much emphasis on like, you know, BBSs and, and uh, line to line communication, because that's what they grew up with. That's what the authors were, uh, were weaned on. And they actually stat out the person who, um, owner, chief programmer of the Hunt Club, called Tally Ho. Cool. <laughs> well, it's interesting to look at these stats, right? So you expect a, and granted the stats are there, but 
if you're looking at a player who wanted to be the ultra net runner, their their intelligence would be a ten, their reflex would be a ten, and their tech would be a ten, and all the other stats they would put as garbage. Whereas Tally Ho highest stat is cool, which is a ten. Their high other highest stat is luck, which is a ten. Their intelligence is a nine, and their reflex is a six or seven, and tech is a six. So um it's definitely interesting to look at uh the various npcs within our, any of these supplements and see that how they're not always power gamers and right. again this person could have been a player or, or could have been an npc that the one of the authors has created we'll we'll know until we interview those people <laughs> That's very true. Um, yeah, I'd like to get a tally on that, on which which NPCs were actually, you know, played by people and which were just, you know, made up for the books. That would be, I would, I would think that would be fairly interesting information. Right, like, like all the people that are mentioned throughout the books, um, you know, from Mike's point of view, like who, who were the players and who were not, right? So Spider was Lisa's character. Um, we kind of know that. Uh, you know, Ripper Jack is Mike's character, but you know, was Johnny a character? Or was he an NPC? Um, um, I always got the feeling that the Silverhand group was like the first group of players that G uh, Mike Pondsmith ever ran, like there was original group. Uh, I've never had anything to back that up. That's just always the feeling I had. And then everything else, all the NPCs that came after were, some were players, some were just uh, background characters. Yep. At least as far as the stuff that Mike wrote. Right. With other authors, who knows? But yeah, every interviewer, every interview we do from now on, we should remember to ask, you know, which which characters did you play? Which were uh, actually part of your group? Once we start but, lining uh, up those people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're at the end of chapter three, moving on to chapter four, which is the Rust Belt. So this is basically uh, kind of the Midwest's from Texas on to the East Coast. Um, <clears throat> this zone is supposed to have a very uh, industrial uh, look to it, um, mainly because this is where most industries, I guess, is, is the concept that is there. Um, so this is going to be the last zone of the United States uh, that will be discussed. And, um, and the various factors that are in here. Again, Netwatch is always mentioned in every section. Um, each Netwatch area is a little different. Uh, so you definitely want to read up on a particular zone's Netwatch. There is an the idea that Netwatch is net, is a nationwide federal organization, regardless of whether it happens in free states or not, is is really important to the lore in my book, because it shows that even in, within the free states, the federal government still has some power and influence. Yep, and that really informed the way I run the federal government in my games. Um, there's also a blur about the European Bank and the uh, Euro Market uh, Consortium. So the E, they call it EMC, and that's that's the other thing that I think one of the problems you get within the various source books is you have various European committees and organizations that are often mentioned, and I don't think there's a consistency. No, um, you're kind of right on that one. 
So you have the EMC, oh. the EEC, the ECC. I want to say there's another one too, the e EUC. Yeah, and they all kind of like overlap each other. Like, let's. Some consist some cons consistency would would have been would have been nice, or at least like some blurb somewhere with all these various factions and how they relate to each other. Uh, just somewhere in some book that would be nice. Oh, one other concept, and <clears throat> I forgot to mention this, with each region, <clears throat> and Bartmos kind of explains it, is Bartmos has a belief, and, and granted it's his beliefs, so as a GM you can take it and do what you want with it, but his belief was each region had its own AI uh, that kind of governed the region, um, and the AI was spawned from uh, from the various net traffic that happened on it. <clears throat> of course, you know, Spider says it's a bunch of, of bullshit, uh, but <laughs> it, it's really up to the GM, I think, um, to determine the validity yeah, of it. Yeah, it. it opens up it opens up uh, an area of you know, GM interpretation as to how how much of this is true and and how much of it is just, you know, crazy dude sniffing his own belly button. So, um, that is present presented in each region, uh, and and Bartmos kind of goes into it. Again, a few of the cities are described, um, mainly because it's the East Coast. So there's quite a few. Um, there's a few uh, data forts specifically within uh, the Washington, D.C., uh, around the monuments that exist there. And the uh, personality, I think, is Dog was listed. And Bartmos from what I can see, didn't really mention Dog. It was mostly uh, Spider Murphy who presented Dog as the personality for this region. Which makes a lot of sense given that, I mean, my my opinion of Bartmos, in addition to him being crazy, is that he was also somewhat... He was extremely introverted. He did not like talking. So him not having like personal opinions on every single one of these guys makes sense. Yep. And that kind of ends this chapter, and we're going to get into chapter five, which actually is consists of two chapters or two regions, which is very odd. Uh, and and the regions are are very distributed. <laughs> I would say <laughs> so there are uh, we have I mean if you look at what at Arasaka I'll go, go ahead go ahead well just to give you uh, an overview of what regions are actually being implemented and again you can address this so you have uh, Atlantis which encompasses South America and you also have Tokyo Chiba region which is interesting that yeah. Tokyo and, and, or sorry, Japan has its own region. Um, I think it's the only. Um, I mean, it was the 90s. It was perfectly believable that that's the powerhouse that Japan would become. Uh, and the fact that this book is also included, or this chapter is also including South America. I mean, Arasaka had, in the 2020 lore, had at that point established such monumental influence over South America that it, it makes sense. It basically is the police force uh, for the entirety of Brazil and uh, well, technically, and many of the uh, technically uh, ran, what was it? Um, not Colombia. Was it Peru? Or Argentina? That basically was I, run by Arasaka. With uh, a it was 
It was uh, it was Brazil out of and because it was uh, because they had such a foothold in Portugal that they extended that influence into Brazil and then Argentina. Okay, well, you did write a source book on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take your word for it. That's uh, that's always a scary concept. I'll take that guy's word for it, but, but I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah, you're you're smarter than the lore than I am. Yeah, so there is definitely a lot of um, Japanese uh, powerhouses uh, mentioned. Uh, Disney is also mentioned, which I thought in America Disney was turn or the Bloods took over Disney. Well, they took over Disney World. All right. Um, but Disney as a corporate powerhouse, they just shifted. Um, I mean, Disneyland is still there. Euro Disney is still there. Uh, Disney Studios are still churning out, you know, Children's Fair and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's still there. It's still a powerful entity. It just... Florida was written off due to coastal flooding and just general collapse. Well, I hope the big D <laughs> isn't listening and starts going after our Talsorian for uh, printing their name in their book. And I think that's one of the things of, of before... I think they'd have a hard time going after a book that's like 30 years old. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Don't know what the statute of limitations are for copyright. Yeah, yeah, I'd probably be surprised. That's that's a very sad state. But that's an interesting thing to see, and, and you know, for for younger viewers, um, product names and company names were freely used in various books, game supplements. Um, and, and other areas compared to today, which a lot of uh, companies now have kind of strut their uh, or flexed their muscles to protect their brand, as it were. Yeah, I mean, even even back then, like Disney gets mentioned a couple of times, and Disney World, like in the uh, oh the. Um, Home of the Brave, it talks about, or uh, Neo Tribes, it talks about, you know, Disneyland being taken over by the Bloods, but it does it in really kind of, I don't, I don't remember it actually mentioning Disney at the, in, in that description. Um, like anytime it talks about like any of the, most of the auto manufacturers, uh, you get things like Toyo Chev instead of, you know, Toyota or Chevrolet or Mitsuzuki instead of Mitsubishi. Well, it was, yeah, and, and I think the concept was, at least at the time, was, you know, companies are consolidating, which, guess what, <laughs> they have been doing. Um, however... Sure, but at the same time, it was, <laughs> I, I imagine, at least partially a ploy to... Uh, not get sued by anybody yeah well unlike today which is basically i'm as a company i'm buying you so i'm not going to even use your name um yeah. and also the concept and you see especially with vehicles in, in cyberpunk 2020 um the concept that companies collaborated to create a specific mm -hmm. vehicle and therefore they created a a hybrid of their name in them um which is something different um so i think it depends on how a company how a company either merged or was bought out right so the the whole concept of corporate mergers was pretty big back in in the day and that 
concept was, okay, we're going to mash each other together and come up with a, a new name. Um, however, today, it, it's there is some mergers going around, but it's mostly we're buying you out and we're taking over your name and your yeah. property. And sometimes we'll squash your name and never use it again. I mean that is that is the sad reality of things how of how things actually turn out in those situations. So, <clears throat> but yeah, this is again a good section to read, um, mainly because you know it, it get dives into uh, how powerful Japan really is, uh, and the other great thing is you have an awesome data fort of Arasaka which I'll, I always use in various different cities besides just Tokyo um, yeah it's it's a massive deadly data fort so not for the faint of heart it is not so this chapter is definitely uh, well worth a read uh, the one thing it does not include is actually a personality, um, unlike the other uh, regions. So I assume they, they assume Arasaka is a personality on its own. <laughs> and you don't need uh, other underground in there. in this region is, is very much a free-for-all. Mm. <clears throat> well... Yeah, so this region, mm, yeah, this region specifically with um, South America, uh, I think is is a little bit of a free for all, but not as bad as um, what was it? Is it Africa's area or uh, Soul Space? We will get to that. Yep. Yes, sir. So the next region is Europe. Uh, which is, I believe, one of the higher controlled areas. Uh, yeah. You can definitely expect Netwatch uh, roaming the streets, as it were. Um, if not Netwatch, Interpol, who's, I think, affiliated with Netwatch in some yeah, way. Yeah, that's always the uh, impression I got, is that Netwatch is... If not Interpol-backed, then at least UN-backed. Mm-hmm. Um, so we know we're at 830, so we might be blowing through a little bit of this, but, uh, this section is very detailed, so, uh, it's definitely well worth a read. There is a nice little, uh, a data fort, sorry, I shouldn't say it's little, um, no, <laughs> but it is a nice setup of, of, of a data fort, because it gets in, again, to that multi-layer or leveled data fort and it it really is a fort in which you have certain ask, uh, access ways that you can only go through and need to uh, kind of kind of route you in certain ways more than any of the others this reminds me of the old game adventure yep um, So the next chapter moves into Solf Space and Africa. And Solf Space is Russia, uh, who really didn't fall with 2020. No. Um, it just, like, rebuilt itself. Um, kind of like the reality of today. <laughs> yeah, they just didn't have the guise of democracy in between it just became the neo-soviet union there was no breakup there was no yeah they just went straight to the point really yep um and then the section of africa or africana uh like, kind of... other than other than uh you know co the court book for uh uh Sovoil, this is really the... Actually, this is 
above and beyond more information you get on the Soviet Union, uh, the Neo-Sov Union, than you find anywhere else. And the same with Africa. Yep. Like, yeah. So, I, At least I, as far as buffeting material. And, and Africa is huge to the point where they talk yeah. about LDLs that aren't on the map. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that you should implement. So, uh, definitely a great read. Uh, and, and gives you kind of some background, at least some knowledge of what's happening in Africa. So I don't think there's any other source book that really gets into um, Africa as a continent and, and what's there, especially when you, when you have like oral air and, and the whole space race happening. Uh, within the yeah, continent. I mean, it really. Africa was really, really underserved, uh, which of course is why I ended up. It and South America are why I ended up doing the two conflict source books, and you know, the third conflict source book about uh, you know the neo-Soviet bloc is uh, it's always been on the back burner um, because there's just so little information about these countries in the book or these continents so your, your next uh, conflict book is going to be about India <laughs> you know now that you freaking mention it that's that's apparently there's at some point maybe going to be a conflict or after the neo so dealing with India and Pakistan thank you you're Thank welcome. you so very much. I, I've given you, <laughs> I've given you a task after your uh, after your uh, supplement on the uh, the I'm trying to describe it your your desert and or sorry dust and sand. Oh yeah, uh, glass road. Yeah, glass road. And then the nomad uh, adventure that I'll eventually be putting out uh, for dust and sorrow. Which I'm helping inspire you, I hope. You absolutely are. So the next... 100 Good. 100%? Awesome. 100%. Woohoo! So for those who don't know, I'm uh, currently in uh, Wisdom's uh, campaign, which is called Dust and Sorrow, along with uh, a few other players. And we're having a blast going along the uh, the Nomad Trail. Yep. Driving uh, or riding security for the uh, Vagabond Express, basically the Nomad Greyhound going. Yeah. With, uh, mm. One Nomad market, market to the next. next. Yeah. And avoiding police as much as we can, because we know the authorities do not like nomads. Uh, so we're getting into the technically the last chapter, uh, which is chapter eight, which includes Orbitville and Wild Space. So Orbitville is the whole near Earth. Um, I highly doubt you want to uh, net run from uh, the planet to any of these uh, facilities. But if your characters do hand up, happen to end up, you know, on Crystal Palace, it's, it's good stuff. And I'm actually, well, so so my campaign, which I'm running for, uh, in my players in in person. Um, damn, I would wish I didn't know that they created a O'Neill two uh, map. <laughs> Because my concept of the map is a little different than this. Um, just because of the size and, and the humongous, uh, humongousness of of the O'Neills, which I think yeah. wasn't really portrayed in the, in the source books. But I will definitely take a look at the, the map again because I've been generating my own and figure out what corporations I need to pull in. Um, currently, the, the players are just a bunch of uh, high rider, low level uh, grunt workers. We're there to I mean, start the revolution. 
I look at the Crystal Palace as an orbital Dubai. It's it's where all the power really sits. Mm -hmm. And the map is so small too. Yeah. There should be so many other co corporations there. Um, but it also does Tycho and the Lunars. Um, they also give uh, data forts for the battle sats, which is definitely going to come in handy uh, for my future campaign. And then the next section goes into Wilder Space. And Wilder Space is the, I don't know, the, the area in between cities is, is my understanding of it. Or... or cities that have become ghost towns so one of the yeah. concept of the net is basically the net is as big as the world uh when you go to it so you can actually from from a city grid you could walk to another city however it's going to take you forever uh versus going yeah into, meow. yeah Yeah, the wilder space is that area beyond where there's no no regulation whatsoever. It is it is the dark net of the uh, or the dark web of the 2020 universe. Yeah. I'm just replying to someone. Um, so Robert no Tables says, yo, so many movies I have seen remind me of something that could be in red. Have you seen the platform? Um, is the platform the movie in which there's a platform that gets lowered to various levels and it first starts off with an abundance of awesome food and each level you know, people like on that? Thing. Yeah. It's kind of like the cube. Like lower levels just get, you know... <laughs> what's left over and what falls down. Yeah. Oh, I love the cube zero. Yeah, so those movies are interesting. Um, and, and even the cube, yes, you, you could consider them kind of cyberpunky, right? In which a, a corporation is doing some type of psychology experiment against humans. Uh, and Robert? If, if you really like uh, the platform, you need to check out Cube Zero and a movie starring Christopher Lambert called Fortress. Yeah, Fortress was good. It will be right up your alley. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, and Cube Zero, I think, was the final in that series. Actually, I think it was like a prequel to all the others, but it was. I think it was the last one made, yeah. Yeah. The, even the pre the first one was just crazy amazing. Um, seeing all yeah. the cues and like not was... seeing Fortress. Yeah, so Fortress, there's two of them, I think, maybe a third one. There are two. the The first play, the first one is is the better one. The second one, the first one just takes place in a prison on Earth in like a futuristic cyberpunk Earth. Uh, the second one takes place on a satellite prison which is it's it's okay it's it's not as good as the first but it's it's still you know it's still there yes and i agree movers movies can alter your mind uh, naked lunch <laughs> was one of those movies for me i think the other movie william, william tell routine the other movie was the exorcist which was this kind of the most scary movie I ever saw? Because I saw it as a kid, like when I was I mean, six it's, or it's seven scary. years old. I, I, movies, movies don't tend to scare me, but The Exorcist genuinely disturbed me. Um, it was a masterpiece of horror. And there was a, I don't think it was a Kevin Smith movie. It might have been produced by Kevin Smith. It was definitely from um, Askew. It was called Vulgar. Um, that movie kind of really disturbed me. Is that the one with John Goodman as... No. Where you're, that's, I believe, Red State. That's Red State. You're right. I have not yeah. seen Vulgar. 
Vulgar was early in in the career, so it has all the cast of Clerks, hmm. but it's disturbing. <laughs> I it was one of the few movies that I was like, one scene was like, yep, nope, I'm done. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, so. Moving along, <laughs> off of that tangent. So we got the wild, wilder space, and again we can touch base on movies uh, once we finish off this book, as it were. Um, yeah, we're almost. It would be free roam. Yeah. So this move, this um, section actually talks about Beijing and I think the how it turned into that ghost city, um, and, and from red right so so the whole virus and how human ai or the ais kind of took over it and this chapter also talks about a lot of the roaming rogue ais that exist and where they live um and then finally you get into the rules appendix which yeah this is the first time in the book you actually get meat as opposed to fluff. Consolidated meat. Um, so these rules actually produce quite a lot of different things. Um, it it kind of describes a little bit more of what the cyber modem is and, and what commands you have and details them a little further than the basic book. Um, the other rules which kind of like really opened my mind to like you know as a player i was like oh, i'm gonna make a net runner oh wait mainframe hacking what the hell is this all about holy christ yeah i can hook up my deck this, into a mainframe and, and make it even more awesome this i mean it's only one two three four five seven eight nine it's ten pages uh, at the very end of the book, but it expands, you know, the Netrunner role and what, what they can and can't do in the internet and what that all means uh, more than any other book in the, in the, in the series, in, in the franchise. Uh, yeah. It really, it really takes a, it really expands out the Netrunner role. Uh, these rules and it was much needed at the time. Yeah, and this also gives you like rules in which you can do uh, battle programming. So you can actually have, you know, the, the concept is that netrunners would gather at like um, sh sh uh, short circuit and and do yeah. fights to determine who who's the the better hacker, as it were. Um, so it kind of gives you a little uh, how to play that out. Um, Somebody had just watched Hackers when they read this. <laughs> <laughs> well, when when I read these rules again, um, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know if you saw the the TV series called The IT Crowd. It's a British. That is my favorite sitcom of British show of all time. Yeah, when they, uh, what was it called? Word something. I forget what. I forget what it was, but basically, Moss was like. Uh, there's there's a, a, a TV show over in Britain, and I forget the name of it, but it has to do with word count. So you get a bunch of letters, letters and you, yeah, 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 you, you, you make a you basically make a word, jumble, but on a but game show format. The whole underground of all these like computer nerds <laughs> doing this thing, just, just being badass in yeah. their own little environment. It was it was beautiful. Like the whole yeah. show was. I really wish there was more of that. Plus, yeah. that's the show that introduced me to Matt Berry, who I think yep. is one of the funniest individuals of all time. Yeah. So, if you're looking for a good Netrunner television series, go watch uh, IT Crowd. Um, it'll get you into the corporate Netrunner. Um, the other thing within this section is uh, the Micronets. So, all those people who are looking on how, do, how can I hack a device... Um, this kind of give you some broad 
uh, ideas yeah, on it's how not to do it. Yeah, it's not exactly that, but it acts as kind of a template for it. Um, uh, like a a concept guide is if you if if you will and you will have to read this multiple times to kind of put your head around it um it also if if i recall correctly uh this is where like runner to runner combat like first becomes a like something codified with rules yep before that it was just always assumed you'd only ever be running you know, net runners against databases as opposed to, you know, net runner on net runner combat. Yep. And also in this section, um, you have some gear porn, right? Some cyber deck, some cyber deck enhancements, some programs. Um, they also stat out various uh, net runner templates. So if you need some stats and, and want some. Uh, quick and easy uh, net runners to kind of plug and play into your game that's also here also here is uh, Rache boss Motes's, uh skills and spider murphy's and of course yeah they're complete write-ups uh, stats skills gear like this is what you need to know about and about Bart, these bastards bartmos is a god yeah um, he is uh, unbelievable um <laughs> I mean, he's got stats that, you know, you would kill for. System knowledge 13. <laughs> I think that's yeah. the highest skill he has, but he goes above and beyond what is capable within the rules. Um, which, of course, you know, being being the god amongst netrunners, of course you're going to have to have something that players want to achieve but will never have because a referee is never going to give it to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, it would sure be nice to have, you know, skills that go above 10 for my character. Yep. Nobody else is fine. Um, so, now that we've finished, what, which, what do you think in, in the various medias, sorry, do you think um, portrayed the net the best, right? Was it, like, Johnny Mnemonic, um... As far as the representation of the net itself, that's an easy one for me. There is an episode of Futurama where they go into the net, and I think that's probably... Everything is wireframes, uh, and is the closer you get to, like, um, institutions with money and, and power, like, they become more intricate, and, you know, color gets introduced and all that, and detail, but... Yeah, that, that 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 episode of Futurama where they go in the net is is probably about perfect for how I see it and how I run it in my game. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, for the net itself, right? The the vast majority, I I always look at it like um, from Johnny Mnemonic, <clears throat> right? In which it's just this yeah. flood of ads, data forts tons of craziness that's in there but when you get into the actual data for it themselves um one movie i really liked was uh disclosure with demi moore and uh oh Mike, yeah that was a that was a good representation and uh michael douglas i thought from from a data point of, or data fort point of view in which they were actually in the data fort and you see a user with kind of their their icons or, or their avatars yeah walking around going to a, a a file cabinet pulling out files and and that craziness um I yeah really that's that's it. that was a pretty good representation to you like that definitely falls into one of the better better visual representations of of what the the virtual net would look like um yeah and that's a there movie was a that mod I, on go ahead, go ahead. Well, to me, Disclosure, I think, is one is an underrated cyberpunk movie. <laughs> Even though yeah. it's not, like, you know, really hardcore technology or whatever, but it's definitely um, near-future, corporate espionage um, kind of movie. But continue your point. 
Oh, I was just going to say, there was a mod, not even a mod, just like a cheat code for GTA 4 that would turn the city into a wireframe. Um, but the like the the signs would still be there, so you'd be cruising around and be a wireframe building with like, you know, a Coca Cola ad on the side that looked normal. Uh, that that always struck me um, as what you know that's what the net should look like in in Cyberpunk Red. I suggested that somewhere. No, but I don't think anybody ever heard it. Right. But that's definitely uh, that also helped influence, you know, what what the net looks like in my world. Right. So, final thoughts. Uh, this is, in my opinion, if if you're just looking for, you know, um, supplements or source books to help you with your game, this is not necessarily it should be one of your top choices. If you're looking for lore and and really uh, an awesome book on detailing the net within cyberpunk this is something you should pick up um, the, the the brain blowout is stuff from here stuff from various chromes and kind of like the the black hand supplement in which accumulates a bunch of stuff um, we might get into uh, brain blowout I, there was some additions that Brain Blowout did add to the game. But I, I feel that if you had I mean, a choice between the two, I kind of would rather see people uh, get the guide versus uh, the brain, brain Blowout. I, I personally find Brainware Blowout to be a more useful book as far as uh, crunch goes. Um, it definitely made Netrunners playable. Uh, like I said, I hope we I hope we uh, detail we go into and review Brainware Blowout in the future. Um, the rules additions it made, uh, particularly in alternate rules like using the card game as your net running rules, that changed running net runners in my game personally uh, tremendously. Um, but for lore, like. Guide to the net is uh, it's as important as uh, you know Home of the Brave or the Rough Guide to the Pacific Rim or Eurosource Plus. Like it, it falls into that category of importance because it just like like I said earlier, it gives detail to a lot of places that weren't that were just barely mentioned in other source books, like the entirety of Africa, the entirety of South America. Uh, the neo soviet union like this is your big source of information for those places yep um plus it like the whole book just gives you you know what you need to know about the actual net itself beyond you know the simple rules stuff not that they're not that the rules for net running are simple by any stretch but uh the concept of the net in in the core book is is fairly abstract and simple yeah, and it actually is larger than Home of the Brave, but shorter than Pacific Rim. Um, but I think Pacific Rim has a lot of uh, game material at the end. Um, yeah. But there is definitely a lot of, of, of source material that you can go through. So yeah, um, any other things we should be talking about with this book? Other than Bart Moss is fucked up and crazy. I mean, we can we can do a whole episode on how fucked up and crazy Bart Moss is. That dude is that dude is beyond nuts. And uh, yeah, it's uh, he was the one of the like core NPC personalities that really had an impact on the actual world itself. Um, other than like the heads of corporation NPCs. Um, like Morgan Blackhand and Johnny Silverhand, they never get mentioned in any game I run, but people mention Rage. Yep. He's well, he took down the net. <laughs> 
Well, we didn't play that. We didn't, like I said, we ignored the events of corporate war. Didn't happen in my game, but you know. So Ray Martmos is still out there being crazy. Yeah. But definitely an interesting character. And it's the dialogue and the 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 viewpoint that the writers took um, trying to get uh, Raisha's uh, point of view made him a very interesting character throughout it. Um, and again, definitely well worth the read. I mean, yeah, he's written... They write him like as a cross between Hunter S. Thompson and uh, William S. Burroughs and Bill Gates. Like, the dude is... He's just not there. Yeah. He's on, a, on another level talking to space fish and stuff. Exactly. <laughs> and you need that crazy. All right. Um, you do. Anything else before we close out? We're almost at uh, our two-hour mark. Uh, no, I think that's about that about covers everything we really wanted to talk about today. Um, next show, we'll, uh, we'll have some interesting stuff lined up. I think I'm going to try and uh, hook up an interview. No promises yet, but... Uh, if not, we'll we'll find yeah. a topic that we can talk about. Um, we we've talked about a few topics that we might want to cover, um, just because I think we know we can definitely talk about that particular topic for two hours, well, without Absolutely. rambling too much. I hope, uh, which we are going to do. If any of you guys, live in audience or uh, on the streaming from YouTube. Uh, if any of you uh, have any suggestions, questions, or ideas, shoot them our way. Uh, either on the YouTube channel, here on Twitch, on uh, the CyberNation Uncensored Discord, or uh, Will's Cyber Smiley uh, page, uh, Discord page. Yep. Um, heck, if you want to send it to personal emails, I'll take those. Um Facebook, whatever. Uh, once again, we'd like to thank Cyber, Cyber Nation Uncensored for hosting us. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, thank you, it's Rob. It was a pleasure. Um, yeah. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys in two weeks. As always, thanks for listening. Yeah. Um, so, like Rosima said, you can. We we are out in the world. Um, specifically for me, you can come to uh, cybersmiley.net. That's without the E in the Cyber Smiley. Um, and you can check out all my utilities. There's a lot of uh, 2020 stuff as well as red um, source material that I, I kind of consolidated and, and allow you hopefully to easier access uh, to that data. Um, uh, I do have a, a Discord similar to uh, Cyber Nation Uncensored. Um, I also am on quite a few other discords, so if you do an at CyberSmiley, there's a good chance you're hitting me. Um, I'm also out there on Reddit. Uh, I don't do Twitch or, or Facebook. Sorry, I can't. I can't, <laughs> I can't deal with those uh, companies anymore. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, um, you can check out Wisdom over at Data Fortress 2020. Um, dot com. He's got you want lore, he's got lore. My site is more I utilities um, and, and helps you with your game. Um, wisdom definitely has the wisdom. Um, also, <laughs> check out his archives. Uh, there is a lot of stuff from old, uh, old yeah, exists. exactly. So, back in the day, there was hundreds of sites uh fan sites hundreds. that were were created and all of them have have fallen throughout the years through attrition um but wisdom I has think at one point there were like 280 sites on my link list and now there's yeah. 
less than 50 active ones and mo and other than yours and mine i don't yeah. think any of them updated um in quite a while yeah well i remember the web rings um and trying to get into oh yeah the web, rings. web rings <laughs> um but yeah just those, uh, those have disappeared completely so if you're looking for old material or old ideas uh the file project that's on uh, data fortress 2020 you can definitely try to find some of the stuff is lost because some of the webmasters just didn't want to share their data um and didn't yeah, want to repost others it. of it weren't archived anywhere uh but i tried to save as much as i possibly could get as many uh yeah uh emailed as many people as i could for permission um yeah, if you want adventures, there's like a hundred or so on there. If you want rules, gear, anything, really, like every website that ever existed, I tried to save as much of that as possible. So, um, and check out the archives and check out my own personal stuff. I've got <laughs> source books, gear books, rules, just general musings. Like, there's a ton of stuff that I've, I, yeah. Yeah, we gotta sort that and organize that a better. <laughs> I gotta help you with that. Doing a yeah, full that's... full crawl on your site and figuring out where all the various links are because. You know. What's funny is is there's a uh, there's a straight up like I don't want to say argument, but like there's. Half the people on the internet think my site should stay the way it looks as like a tribute to, you know, the retro 90s. I don't have a problem with how it looks. I have a problem with trying to find anything on that site. I mean, it's simple. Sure. It's I, I go to and source gear, book and gear. underneath, well, no, because each source book has some gear that doesn't always link to this, to the gear section. But At one point. The last time I updated the gear books, I added all the gear from those source books. So. Yeah, I think it there's there. there's a Google utility that can actually just target your site with all your pages and find stuff. So I, I I'll do some research and give you like a little search box that basically <laughs> is powered by Google, but will will find whatever's in that site and on whatever page you might have hidden, scrolled away in the in the. A rabbit hole of links that you have to follow to find that that data yeah that's the real problem is i've had to change hosts so many times that i tried to fix all the links but i'm sure there are still some hiding yeah that don't link to anything anymore so i'll see what i can do to help you out with that um all right i think we're done all right everyone As always thank you for listening uh yeah. See you guys in two weeks. Yeah, see you next month. Ta-ta.